Over Adam Bezvenik, we've got him here from Looking Glass Capital. Uh, thanks for popping in again, and um, you know, excited to learn a little more about your background. I know you're an emerging manager, and um, you know, you've made a lot of progress, and you know, you do have a unique, uh, you know, investment thesis. So excited to kind of go deeper and and learn a little more about that. But before we start, you know, I'd love to learn a little more about your um, your background and you know how you got started. And um, you know maybe your journey into into venture capital. You know the audience here for your knowledge. You know we have a couple of emerging VCs, and then we have uh, some people that are uh, looking to break into venture. And then there's just people that are product managers and um, people that come from a tech background that um, are also you know trying to learn more about venture as well. So that's kind of the audience. And uh, you know with teeing that up, maybe you can kind of uh, give a quick overview of your background. Then I can kind of try to navigate the uh, the conversation. Yeah, totally. Um, well, thanks. Thanks for the invite and for having me. Um, the sort of relatively quick background is I uh, graduated from college in 2009 um, from Duke. I spent two years in investment banking as an analyst in New York City uh, right after that sort of post you know, financial crisis and, and recovery and really took advantage of the fact that New York tech was seeing a resurgence during that period to you know, in my spare hours outside of living inside of a, a cubicle, um, try and network my way into the early stage tech ecosystem here. And I did that by way of just cold emailing literally hundreds of VCs in New York to get coffee, to get on the phone with me, and then also VCs in, in Boston and Silicon Valley. And I had, um, I had spent time as an undergrad sort of dabbling in startups and tech, but just didn't pursue that after school, but knew, um, knew it was a, a transition that I wanted to make a little over a decade ago at this point. And I was going back to business school in the fall of 2011 and was gonna use that as a pivot point to sort of make this career uh, you know, career transition. And rather than wait to get to business school to start doing that, I figured I might as well sort of hit the ground running. And so literally February of 2011, I think was the first cold email I sent to a VC. Within a couple of weeks, I was getting coffee with uh, the, first, the first person I ever got coffee with was David Rodriguez, who was an associate at Graycroft, who had graduated from Duke three, two or three years before I did. Hey, Adam, can you hear me? People who were very generous with their time and gave me great advice. And one of those people that I reached out to... Um, in March of 2011 was Chris Saka, who had started Lowercase Capital. I think Chris was maybe two and a half or three years into Lowercase One being formed. It during my two years of business school. from 2011 to 2013. And um, during that time, I was working part-time for Chris, probably 10 to 15 hours a week on projects with portfolio companies, doing research that went into him raising fund two, um, sourcing deals, evaluating deals that were coming across his desk. Um, and I sort of was able to leverage my relationship with Chris and you know goodwill from him to get in front of a whole host of other investors and founders and operators that um, really trusted him and sort of the seal of credibility he kind of bestowed upon me by letting me work with him. And so when I graduated from business school in 2013, I moved to the Bay Area. I joined a startup called Wanilo, which was an early player in the social commerce space. Uh, at the time was competing pretty closely with Pinterest. Um, they had just raised a very large Series A, which or at the time was a very large Series A. It was $11 million, which in the winter of 2013 was an astronomically large Series A compared to what uh, what was happening in market. I think the valuation was over 100 million, which for a Series A eight years ago was almost unfathomable mm -hmm. um, compared to uh, what was happening at the time. And I joined them as a 20th employee, the first business hire. And that was a role that I got um, after Josh Koppelman at first round, who was one of their investors, had uh, introduced me to the founder of the company. And I spent um, just under a year at Winilo running biz dev for them, figuring out how to monetize the platform and the millions of users that were on it. 
And while I was living in San Francisco, um, I met Tim Kamada, who was the founder of Deep Fork Capital, which was a small seed fund. And I joined Tim. He was a single GP. I guess now we call them solo capitalists, um, but a single yeah. GP fund. Uh, and I joined Tim uh, in the summer of 2014 full time. And I've been in venture ever since. Um, I spent just under three years at Deep Fork um, investing in seed. Now I would say we would call it pre-seed and seed, but again, like this space, lots of things change. Pre-seed wasn't its own asset class or own sort of division of seed seven years ago. Yeah. Um, but generally we were investing in million to $3 million rounds doing 250 to 500k checks um, in a very generalist fashion um, across a whole host of software businesses. And then um, after just under three years at Deep Fork, I got recruited by a very large hedge fund called Anchorage Capital, just based in New York, uh, to help lead their early stage investment effort, um, predominantly looking at Series A and Series B investments. Whereas before I got there, they had started to make some growth to pre-IPO uh, investments out of a separate fund that they had raised. I spent um, a little over two years at Anchorage from early 17 to the middle of 2019. And I left Anchorage in the middle of 2019 to get back to doing seed investing um, and ultimately start looking glass. And I spent the back half of 2019 investing as an angel, um, made five investments into companies that were meant to be indicative of what would be a fit for, uh, for looking glass fund one. And in five founders that I had known previously and had sort of direct relationship um, with them when they were going out to raise that initial, their initial rounds. And then I kicked off the fundraising process for Looking Glass basically at the end of 19 into the turn of 2020, not obviously knowing what was going to happen <laughs> yeah. in, you know, in, in March, um, but ended up getting to a first close uh, the Monday before Thanksgiving of 2020 and have continued to raise the balance of Fund One now and have been investing out of Fund One since November um, and have half a dozen investments um, in Fund One now. Um, that, you know, knock on wood are, are very early, but yeah. um, a few are doing, um, doing quite well from a traction and trajectory perspective. And um, yeah, the, the goal is to, you know, raise around 12 million, maybe a little bit more for fund one, I have substantial percentage of that sort of wrapped up at this point mm -hmm. and demonstrate that um, I can operate <laughs> as a lead or first yes investor in the vast percentage, um, vast majority of the of the portfolio companies that end up in Fund One, sure, and use that as a jumping off point for raising a, a larger institutional fund too. So that's the yeah sort of background on, on myself and and Looking Glass, and you know happy to take the conversation wherever is uh, most useful for people. Yeah, Adam, I wanted to personally congratulate you because I noticed that you were nominated as one of the top five emerging managers. So you know, just oh, wanted thanks. To personally, you know, recognize that. I thought that's just a huge, um, you know, huge thing to be, you know, proud of. I also know Ariana. So, you know, just, you know, people like you guys are really, um, really awesome, you know, just to, just to learn from and, you know, uh, you know, have as a partner and, and, you know, as a mentor and example. And, you know, one thing I want to unpack with mentorship is, um, you know, maybe you can share a little bit about your experience with Chris Saka, um, and maybe kind of how you built that relationship with them. You know, when you started out, did you, um, did you build this trust by maybe sourcing some initial deals that you thought he would be interested in? And I guess any advice you'd have for people in the audience um, to maybe just kind of build that relationship, especially, especially with someone as top tier as uh, Chris Aka, you know, for, for many people that might be intimidating, right. To, to, um, to kind of approach somebody like that. That's just so well known. Yeah. I mean, I think I had a couple things working, to my advantage in that 10 years ago, tech wasn't anywhere near as I'll call cool <laughs> as, yeah. as it is now. And, and certainly venture um, and, and certainly seed, right? The idea of, uh, you know, Chris's fund one, I think was like eight and a half million dollars or $8 million. Mm -hmm. And so like, I remember talking to friends and I'm like, I'm going to try and work with this guy who manages $8 million. And I had friends in banking that were like, uh, like recruiting at KKR and, and Carlisle and Apollo. And you know, there was an allure of working for a very large fund Got and it. working on big deals and you know, tons of AUM. And so the idea of, um, you know, going to 
try and work for someone who managed, you know, like as little as I'm trying to manage now, right? It was just like not, <laughs> like didn't, didn't seem like a, a particularly attractive thing to do to, to many of my like finance peers. And then I'd also say sort of this move from finance to tech mm-hmm. was definitely um, not in vogue 10 years ago. Yeah. Whereas now there, you know, it's a, it's a well-worn path to move from a, you know, consulting or finance or banking gig to, mm-hmm. you know, a product manager role or a biz dev role at a startup and then try and move over to venture. Um, and so you know, a lot of this comes down to, to timing. And so sending a cold email that Chris actually responded to without any follow-up yeah. was, you know, there was just a lot less noise in his inbox, frankly. Sure. Um, so I think that was totally working to my advantage just to at least get on his radar as far as sort of, but then, you know, to get a response is one thing, but to your point, to build the relationship with him, mm-hmm. I, I was, I, I have a blog. I don't maintain it as much as I should. Um, but back then I was writing religiously. And so every time I wrote a post that I thought could be helpful or useful or relevant to Chris, I sent it to him. I remember writing a post about, you know, comparing Foursquare to Instagram when Instagram had fewer users than, than Foursquare did. Um, and Chris was in an early investor in Instagram at the time. And I was sort of giving him my hypothesis for why I liked Instagram over, over Foursquare. And, you know, I was just trying to, you know, the way he phrased it is like add value before you ask for value. Right. I was just trying to sure. like be genuine and authentic in my outreach to him mm-hmm. without asking for anything in return. And it was only when I found out that he had had um, a woman as a part-time associate when she was a second year business school student um, that he had ran a process to hire her that I reached out to Chris and said, I know that, and she's now a good friend of mine. I've co-invested with her. I've known her literally 11 years at this point. Her name's Ellie Wheeler. She's a general partner at Graycroft. Yeah. Um, when I found out that Ellie had that role, I reached out to Chris after I had already sent him emails, had already been repl- uh, you know, blog posts, had already been showing up in, in his at replies on Twitter. And this is when he was, you know, incredibly engaged, like active on Twitter from a tech and startup perspective. And I basically said to him, I know that Ellie's graduating from business school. Um, instead of running a process to hire someone, why don't you just like hire me? I, I wasn't as blunt <laughs> as that, <laughs> but, uh, but basically said to him, like, I, I, I know I can do a good job for you. Yeah. Um, and I would love to learn from, from you. And I don't think there's anyone better, um, investing at this stage. And I was really hooked by Twitter. I was like addicted to that product. I still use it every single day. I still have tweet deck on my you know second screen. Yeah. Um, and the fact that he was such an early believer and had such, so much conviction in that product early on was one of the reasons why he was so compelling to me mm-hmm. as someone to, to work with um, and, and work for. And so I really leaned heavily into that as a hook. And I think maybe as a piece of advice, I think, you know, looking at what other investors have backed from a thematic perspective or product perspective or category perspective, and really understanding how that aligns with what you care about as a current or potential investor, I think is a really genuine way to build that relationship. If, you know, I, I deeply admire what Lux and data collective invest in, but I have, I can't talk the talk with Josh Wolf about, you know, satellites or frontier tech. Um, And, but I could riff on my experience as a user of Twitter and a product obsessive and someone who could see where that product was going as a user. And Chris, you know, really appreciated that. Um, And so I think that was really what was one of the key drivers in sort of my ability to build the dialogue and relationship with him. And ultimately um, like he gave me a project to work on, which was list, give him 25 companies that were not obviously going to work. Like they didn't have to be seed, but like, you know, could be series a funded, but things that were not screamingly obvious. Mm -hmm. Um, And I remember like iterating with him on that sort of Google doc that he and I would go back and forth on. And that was a way for him to kind of understand, you know, how do I discover companies? What do I think is interesting or compelling? Um, and that was a 
you know, in some ways a test um, for me and in other ways was you know, deeply satisfying for me to like be able to pitch him an idea. Yeah. Right. Um, and so it was through that process, which was adding value for him, right? I was putting companies on his radar that he might not have known about, or he might not have been paying attention to and providing data on why I thought they were potentially compelling investment opportunities that he ultimately, you know, gave me basically, you know, gave me homework to do and use that as a jumping off point for a, a project with Twitter, which was the first thing I worked on with him. Sure. That's interesting. So just so I'm clear. So he, the 25 companies were obvious passes is what you're saying. So it's you, so that's kind of like the reverse of a typical VC, you know, entrance quiz where they, where they tell you investable companies. Is that correct? Like well, actual it, it, passes or. He, he, he just wanted companies that were not like screamingly obvious yeses. Got and it. Like, like they could have raised money previously, but he yeah. wanted me to, you know, he didn't want me just cherry picking, you know, the last 25 companies I read a TechCrunch article about, but like, you know, give him, give him a list of companies that, and I, I'm, I probably still have access to that Google doc. It'd be funny to go back sure. and look at what was <laughs> on that list, you know, 10 years ago yeah. um, and see, you know, maybe how well or poorly I did. Um, but he, he wanted, you know, things, you know, he saw lots of stuff. He wouldn't mean to, he, it was more of a test to see like, all right, well, how resourceful are you in uncovering companies that, that I'm not going to know about or that I'm not going to see. Um, so it was more about yeah. that. No, that's really helpful. Um, and how has your content creation changed? Cause you, I know you used to, um, you know, blog religiously. Has that, has that changed to podcasts or, or video? You know, for me, it's just kind of easier for me to have a conversation and I try to blog when I can. And a lot of times when I blog, it's kind of a bookmark that I use to, take notes and then I share it and get feedback, but has your, you know, how has your content creation evolved? Are you using different mediums or do you still just prefer blogs and, you know, tweets and, and notes on your own to share with the community? Yeah. I mean, the, the reason I even started blogging in the first place came out of a conversation I had with one of these VCs that I mm -hmm. cold emailed, um, yeah. Ben Siskovic, who was an associate at IA Ventures way back in the day, I guess on IA Fund One, maybe mm -hmm. even like maybe even like Roger's like prototype fund. And Ben sure. was like, tweeting is great, but you need to, you need to blog. Like you just need to write longer form content yeah. and pick a platform to write on. Treat that as like a diligence exercise of that product that you're using. I chose Tumblr, which in 2011, like was still very, very young. Um, and, um, and he was like, just, I, I viewed it as just having a repository of content so that if someone Googled yeah. me, they would see everything that I've written and what my thoughts are. And sure. the content really evolved from things that now look in hindsight were like probably fairly cringeworthy mm -hmm. um, to, uh, you know, more uh, you know, things that I felt were more tactical. Like I remember after I had lived in San Francisco a year, I moved back to New York and I spent, um, I wrote a post about like my first six months of the VC at Deep Fork and I was comparing New York versus SF um, and what it was like as a you know, junior VC who was straddling both coasts. And, you know, I was flying to San Francisco every single month for a week at a time and sort of comparing, you know, founder personalities and profiles and sourcing in those, in, in those, cat, in those, in each market and the themes and sectors that I thought were compelling in each of those cities. And then, um, I was still writing fairly regularly and I wrote a post called my VC code, which was basically meant to be like, this is how I think VCs should behave. Mm -hmm. um, like you don't ghost people, you like close a loop with that, close every loop with every founder. You show up prepared for every meeting. You don't look at your phone during a meeting when you had in-person meetings. Like, like, you, like basically like, I felt like the bar for being a good person in venture was so appallingly low that I was going to like put out there, these are all the things that like every venture investor, like should be table stakes for every venture investor yeah. before, like when you're sourcing, when you're evaluating and post-investment. And, um, and then when I left Deep Fork, I updated that post and did my VC code 2.0 when I went to Anchorage and, you know, updated it in the context of investing at a slightly later stage at, you know, writing larger checks at a larger firm and Anchorage, 
being at Anchorage really sort of handcuffed me when it came to like content creation mm -hmm. as a hedge fund that has public and private um, holdings, has a different level of compliance, sure. has different set of expectations around how their investors behave publicly. Like I couldn't have Anchorage in my Twitter bio. I couldn't list that I was a venture investor on my LinkedIn uh, profile. I could just say that I was an investor at Anchorage Capital. Yeah. Um, like, and so it just kind of hamstrung me as to what the volume I could write and what I could write and how I could promote it. Um, and since then, I've been fundraising a significant portion of time. Um, so I can't really actively promote that I'm fundraising um, from a public so general solicitation perspective. Um, and so I've been sort of more conscientious about uh, when I've written posts and how I've written them. So for instance, the last thing I wrote over the summer, which is meant to sort of augment my own fundraising process, which is I called the lost art of early stage VC. And it was, and it's sort of my, you know, thesis on what the right approach is for being an early stage investor in this market, the right fund size, the right strategy for portfolio construction and follow-ons. And it's really, um, it's really meant to, I mean, it lives in my data room on my, <laughs> for my fund. It's, yeah. it's, it was more about uh, me being able to push that to LPs in a private manner. I didn't explicitly say, this is how Looking Glass is going to invest. Um, but if anyone read it after I tweeted it, you would quite clearly understand that this is how I'm going to be operating on a go forward basis. Um, and it, it really was like an inside baseball post that, that really only resonated with, I think, other, other fund managers and, and maybe some LPs. I do think it would be helpful for founders to understand sort of the, the, the way that funds think about those dynamics because it significantly affects them. Um, but, um, but most of the feedback I got was from other fund managers um, that manage similarly sized funds to the kind of strategy that I was calling out. Sure. Well, that's helpful. And it looks like we got a quick question here. So any tips on sourcing companies, maybe inbound and outbound that you, um, that you'd like to share for, for the audience, any best practices on maybe both of those channels? Yeah. I mean, when I first started, almost all of my sourcing was outbound because no one knew me or who I was or, or, or in some way, like, or deep fork. So yeah. I was discovering companies through, through Twitter, through my own research. If I came across a company or an idea that I thought was interesting, I would then kind of look around that space and like, what are the other, you know, this can't be the only company that's building X. There have, there has to be at least a handful of other people trying to do something similar. Um, and so I would sort of use like a hub and spoke style model of sourcing mm -hmm. um, to, and then I would just reach out to founders totally cold and say, this is who I am. This is why I'm reaching out to you. This is how I think I can be helpful. I believe X, Y, and Z as it relates to what you're building. And like, do you want to get on a call or do you want to grab coffee or, or, or what have you? And I still do that. Um, mm -hmm. Though my percentage of inbound uh, deal flow, deal flow is now, you know, basically the exact opposite of what it was when I started seven years ago. Um, you know, I, I use, I look at accelerator companies. I look at companies coming out of Techstars and Y Combinator. And I talk to, talk to companies out of, coming out of some of those batches that are relevant to me. And, but I also just use them, to my previous point is like inspiration for other ideas and other companies that could be building in similar spaces or uh, employing a different business model, but in the same, the same category or theme. Um, and I do, I probably get at least, uh, I probably get at least three emails a day from a, from founders totally cold inbound. And I reply to every single one, um, no matter if the, my response is as simple as I'm sorry, this isn't a fit for the fund. Right? Like yeah. I, I just think there's nothing worse than sending an email to somebody and just having it dangle out there and then sending a follow-up and just not, not knowing um, whether that person even read it or if they just deleted it or what have you. And so as someone who is going through their own fundraising process now, like I have the like utmost level of empathy for every 
entrepreneur who's simultaneously like fundraising while yeah. I'm, while I'm doing that. Um, and then I got a, a lot of inbound um, or um, you know intros from uh, from other investors, founders that I've worked with before, founders that I passed on who genuinely enjoyed speaking to me and would have loved for me to be an investor. And if I can't invest in their company, then the next best thing is for me to invest in you know their friend's company. Yeah. And so, um, and then I have, you know, the, the funny thing happens when someone knows that you have a checkbook, all of your friends immediately have other friends that are raising money. And so like, inevitably there'll be a friend from undergrad who emails me and says, Hey, like a friend of mine quit their job and is starting a company. Like, I have no idea if this is interesting to you. Like, do you want to talk to them? Or, um, you know, my cousin is raising, is starting a company doesn't really know what he's doing, you know, would you talk to him? Um, and so um, you know, out of the six companies that are in the fund right now, the one is a guy I went to college with. Um, we weren't close, but you know, we, we knew each other. One came from an LP. One came from an investor who didn't invest in the company. One came from an investor who was investing in the company. Uh, one came from a founder I passed on when I worked at Anchorage. Um, so it's a pretty sort of, and in terms of like what's in the pipeline, it's a, again, a mix. Like there are people that I'm talking to right now that reached out to me totally cold. I had never heard of them. Yeah, They just sent me a DM or an email. And there are people I'm talking to now that I, I had to cold email because mm-hmm. I found, about, found out about what they were working on and love the idea. And, um, on the surface, it seems like something I would love to love to invest in. Yeah. Um, what's the, what's kind of the maximum lead time to respond? I think you're really good in responding the same day, you know, when, when is just too long, you know, I I try to at least do it in 48 hours. Um, but you know, is a week really, uh, inappropriate, you know, just, just from your best practices, what do you recommend? Yeah. I mean, I send my own cold emails to yeah. LPs all the time. I, mm-hmm. I tend to follow up. If I don't hear get a response, I tend to send a follow up with ideally new information, something that sure. is additive to the original, original note between a week and two weeks after I usually give yeah. a minimum of a, a minimum of a week. You know, mm-hmm. Sometimes, you know, I never, I never email on a Friday. Yeah. I always email sometime between eight and 9am scheduled. <laughs> that's, have them scheduled. And that's what I do too. Yeah. Um, I try. They're, they're drafted. They're drafted at like 1 a.m. and then scheduled to go out. Um, I'm also on your website. I see that you live in New York. You're married and you have a daughter. I live yes. in New York. I'm married and I have a son. So I need advice from you on <laughs> how you handle it. Uh, I time box it, and you know I have like a no phone policy. You know after six. You know my son's got. He started this soccer program, you know, so that's another thing that is kind of in the mix now. So kind of trying to make sure I can pick him up and take him to soccer. So how do you balance all that and just have good harmony, um, you know, and, and just make everybody, you know, at home and, and, and also professionally happy and, and, you know, any, any frameworks, time boxes, you know, no phone policies, anything, man, whatever you can get. How old's your son? He's four. Okay. You're a little, you're a little ahead of us. We're almost two. So okay. We're, 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 you know, we're 50% of the way there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, you know, we put, we put her to bed every single night. We mm-hmm. are fortunate that we have uh, really great help with the nanny who's been able, who is able to come. And I mean, without that, I don't know what we would do. My wife works full time also. Yeah. So we, you know, the days when we haven't had her are just, it's, it's chaos and we're just sort of alternating. I, she has like you know, a much more of a real job than I do. Like <laughs> she has, she works, she works at DoorDash. Mm-hmm. So she has like colleagues and, a, and a boss and a team that she manages. So like, if I, like, I'm just me. So yeah. <laughs> uh, my schedule is definitely more flexible um, than hers. If, you know, fall hell is breaking loose and things need to <laughs> like uh, schedules need to shift. Um, it's easier for me to reschedule something than for her to like adjust schedules yeah. for you know, 10 other colleagues or something like that. Um, I, I mean, honestly, I'm terrible at, uh, at knowing when to stop 
or he can yeah. just like cut cut things off. Um, but generally, like I don't start doing any work until like nine thirty sure. in the morning, um, and you know most of my evening is spent trying to like hopefully like relax and chill a little bit, watch some yeah. sports and some TV, and passively catch up on on email that just got pushed to the side during the day because of, you know, back-to-back Zooms. Um, but it's definitely, uh, I think it would be easier to um, compartmentalize if I weren't working from you know, kitchen table all the time right now. Sure. Um, I'd say like the stuff that I do tie, I do make it a very concerted effort about sort of blocking off is more just for my own schedule during the day mm-hmm. um, as it relates to, uh, you know, working with portfolio companies versus pitching versus sourcing. So like I allocate a day every single week to nothing but portfolio support. So um, I, that's, that's Thursday. So Thursday is like, I'm not taking, I'm not taking pitches. Um, I'm not uh, raising out, trying to raise money unless I like absolutely, absolutely have to like take an LP meeting. Yeah. Like I try and allocate Thursdays um, for, meeting with existing founders in the portfolio, um, trying to close candidates for them, talking to other investors who could um, invest alongside me or follow on in companies in the portfolio and really make sure that um, you know, that ensures that 20% of my week, um, 20% of all of my time really is allocated to portfolio support no matter what. Um, and also makes, you know, gives founders confidence that if they, you know, I'm, I believe I'm very, very responsive to them, but they know mm-hmm. that like on a Thursday, like they a hundred percent can reach me sort of instantaneously. So what's the biggest uh, common um, area of support that they're reaching out to you for? Is it, you know, just general, you know, growth? Is it product development? Is it fundraising? Uh, where are you seeing in general, you know, when, when founders get to your stage uh, need the most support specifically, from VCs and, and where do the VCs need to make sure that they're offering that support? Yeah, I'd say, I mean, the product stuff is usually reserved. Like I, I do a monthly call with every founder in mm-hmm. the portfolio, um, monthly at a minimum. Sometimes we do bi-weekly, uh, bi-weekly. Yeah. And that, those calls are usually product oriented, sort of discussing features they're shipping. You know, I'm, I'm using the test flight or the latest version of every product or doing a screen share so I can see the latest build and I can give feedback. I'd say in between those, uh, those conversations, the things that people need the most help on are, is hiring, mm-hmm. bar not. Like, and so I try and do my best to source potential candidates, um, but really like, I can also be most helpful in trying to close candidates. So like last week, uh, a company that I invested in had an engineer they were trying to hire who was deciding between joining their company and like a large sort of growth stage company. And he wanted to talk to an investor to understand sort of how an investor perceived this company's prospects, you know, what was working, what wasn't working, um, you know, and, and how I, you know, I'm biased, but I'm, no, I'm nowhere near as biased as the CEO. Um, and so um, I you know, got on the phone and talked to, sort of this engineer for I don't know, 45 minutes or an hour, answered a bunch of his questions, talked about how I, how I thought about the company, how I thought about his particular role in the context of the business. Mm-hmm. Um, and he ended up joining, joining the company right after our call, which was great because they need to ramp up product development. <laughs> um, and so um, that's, I, I've started to do, I wrote a post um, back probably your, one of the previous questions I wrote a post like two or three weeks ago um, about um, a role that a company was hiring for. And the inspiration behind it was that I oftentimes like I've caught myself doing this and I see other VCs do this all the time where they tweet like, Hey, like this company that I invested in is super awesome. And they're hiring an engineer. Like if it's you, like send me a DM or like, if it's a friend of yours, like send them my way. And it's like, okay you're just shouting into like the ether and you're hoping that like, you know, you like someone takes the time to look up the company, look up the role, like does the homework, understands why this is interesting. 
And so what I did is I wrote a post about the company, why I was excited about it. And in particular, um, the role they're hiring for and why that role was so valuable and integral to what that company is building and why that role is so exciting for someone who is, would be joining this company and putting a lot more context and color around that particular, um, uh, that particular opportunity. And uh, the feedback that I got from, from other investors was, I was shocked by it. I had like three investors like text me. They were like, this is such a smart idea. Like I need to start doing this, which I, I just felt like was a very obvious sort of like evolution of like the tweet, right? Like give, give people a reason why they should be excited about this engineering role, not just like apply for this job. Um, and it's a way to, you know, really show like demonstrable value to the portfolio companies. It's not just like a lazy tweet, right? I took the time to write, you know, you know like a 400 word blog post, you know, dug into the job, the job description, really put a lot more thought behind why that role was so um, pivotal to this particular company and the product they're building. Um, not just like, oh, it's an engineer for a software company. Of course it's valuable, right? Like, um, like actually put a little bit more, um, more color around it. And so um, that's, that's one thing that I, literally every company I have in the, in the portfolio, like hiring is the top of mind. And the last yeah. thing on, on fundraising, like that in some ways, like that's, that's the easiest thing I can help with. Um, sure. Like I, I don't know. I have a list of probably 90 series A and series B funds that I have like a partner level relationship with, and I can put them in touch with, you know, guaranteed probably 10, 10 funds for sure on like every fundraising process. And I'm like, and not just to put them in touch with, but like get them a meeting with at least 10 funds. Um, in addition to like whoever else on their cap table is like doing that work for them too. Um, and because I led series A, B and C deals at Anchorage, I have this differentiated perspective compared to a lot of other seed managers who never sat in that seat before. And so sure. understand a lot around how those, um, how those, those investors think about leading those rounds, what they're looking for in a way that, you know, a seed, a seed investor who's never done anything but seed just, mm -hmm. they've seen their companies raise follow on money, but they've never actually had to le write a series A check. Sure. So that is a perfect tee into a topic that I want to talk about because um, it's actually something that I read on that same article about the, um, the article that you're on about being one of the top five VC. So I think under, I think it's under Ariana's post, um, the check size to time spent with founders ratio. Um, you know, I think that's really helpful that you've been, you know, at those different check sizes, those different stages. So it's kind of something I want to write a blog about and, you know, just go deeper on um, what are some of the things to keep in mind when it comes to the etiquette and just respecting founders time, uh, you know, at different size checks and, you know, the time that's spent in, do you have a rule of thumb, you know, depending on uh, the size check versus the time that you're uh, taking up from the founder? For me personally, I try and write the same check size into every single company. Yeah. Um, that's, that will probably evolve as the fund scales in size. Yeah. Um, and I can maybe, comp I can sort of segment out the check size into, you know, a million dollar round or million and a half dollar round compared to a $3 million round. Sure. But for the, for out of fund one, I want to write, you know, a 350 K check on average into every company, whether they're raising a million dollars or $3 million. Um, and the round sizes I've done have been eight, 800 K a million, a million five and two and a half um, in terms of like the um, large checks out of the fund so far. And those have, three have been three fifty, and one has been 400. Yeah. Um, I think the, the percentage of, the check size compared to the fund size is a very good metric for understanding what attention you're going to get from that investor though, if you're a founder, um, right? Like a large multi-strategy, multi-stage VC fund invested alongside me in that 800K round 
He did 450. I did 350. Minus 350 out of 10 to 12. There's his 450 yeah. out of a billion. Sure. <laughs> Literally. So like the founders know that I am the, even though my check size is smaller. Mm-hmm. Hey, Adam, can you hear me? I think you uh, froze for a second. That, that's just the, the nature of the, of the percentage. Of, oh, did I freeze? Yeah, I think you froze for like the last uh, two, three seconds. So you mind, uh, you mind repeating that? I think I lost it. Sorry. I think you froze again. Sorry, am I back now? Yeah, yeah, you're back. No, okay. no worries. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think saying, you like the three. I did three fifty. This other yep. funded four fifty. Yeah, I led it. Um, my three fifty means way more to me than their four fifty means to them. Sure. Like, right and rightfully so. I don't blame them. Mm -hmm. And so the founders know, like, yes, they're going to get help from that fund. They are going to get support. But like, when the chips are down, and like they need like immediate help, like, they're going to come to me. Yeah. Um. I'm going to, I'm the one talking to them, you know, every single month. I'm the one in a group text with them today. I was just checking in on uh, this like founding engineer hire that they're making. And, um, you know, they're doing a sort of one month trial with him first. Um, like I'm the one checking in on, you know, the test flight build mm -hmm. um, and, you know, giving product feedback. And it's, you know, as long as founders are sort of eyes wide open, going into a relationship with an investor as to what they should expect out of them. Like, I think that's what's most important. And I think all too often, maybe founders don't understand that, you know, there's an opacity in their relationship with the investor and they don't know what their expectation should be because mm -hmm. they don't know how they fit into the broader, you know, portfolio of that firm. Sure. Yeah. No, it's helpful. And then uh, do any of the LPs have interest in spending time with the founders too? You know, when they do the references, that's something that I've been hearing often from emerging managers because a lot of the emerging managers, their LPs are also former business people, right? So they, they want to get involved. Uh, obviously it's kind of a, I've had this conversation like three times in the last two days with different emerging managers, but it's kind of a balancing act of not getting micromanaged and, you know, but also taking feedback at the same time and synthesizing it and being thoughtful. So, um, you know, what, what are your experiences with, uh, with LPs and, um, the type of LPs that you like working with? Do they, um, do they also like to be involved with, um, meeting some of the founders and maybe even meeting the founders before, um, you know, writing the check and, and allocating? Yeah, I don't, I don't have any LPs in the fund that want to meet founders mm -hmm. prior to my investment. Um, okay. the, the, a lot of the LPs who are in the fund though, they want to be helpful. Like mm -hmm. they want to, um, make themselves available. So I have, you know, a bunch of individual VCs themselves who are investors in the fund who could be, you know, co-investors in rounds that I participate in. Some are at much larger firms that want to lead the series A or series B of some of these companies and their check in the fund is as much about supporting me and the relationship that I built with them as it is about, this is a scouting vehicle for them um, sure. and a lead, lead uh, generation vehicle. And then I have a lot of people in the fund that are you know, founders and operators themselves. So I have a woman who's a very senior director of product at LinkedIn who invested in the fund and She's like, anytime a founder wants to do a, a product whiteboarding session, like, let me know. And like, I'll roll up my sleeves and spend an hour with them. And like, that is way more valuable than her check. I'm very happy that she, you know, committed capital to the fund. Sure. Um, but it's way more valuable for me to be able to call on her and offer up her services to these founders then. Um, and she has a vested interest in helping them now. Like I yeah. could have gone to her probably without, you know, without relative hesitation mm -hmm. to ask for that type of feedback. But now she has real skin in the game and wants these companies to succeed. Yeah. Um, and I've, you know, 
three different people who are in, you know, uh, different product marketing and ad type roles at, at Facebook who could all be, you know, helpful to, to companies who are trying to navigate that ecosystem. I have sure. uh, someone who's in product marketing at Google. Um, I've got the founder of a company that I invested in at, at Deep Fork, um, who he himself is an active angel. And so um, he's co-invested with me in one company already. And mm -hmm. so, um, and he's a potential partner for that company. Like his, his company Ease is a potential uh, partner for the portfolio company in, in the Looking Glass Fund. So um, I have selected a, a substantial number of individuals who like, I think about building out the LP base the same way that I would advise any founder to build out their cap table. Just like recognize what your blind spots are and surround yourself with people that are complementary to you and can add value in ways that, um, you know, can be helpful that have maybe a comparative advantage compared to your own skill set. And so sure. like, I think I can provide good product feedback, but I've never served as a true PM. She, this woman's been a PM at eBay, Yahoo, Twitter, LinkedIn. Like she's, you know, seen, and she's been a found, venture backed founder. So like she, she's like the ideal person to like dig in with, with founders on, on this type of work. So yeah. that's how I, how I thought about it. And I, you know, I, there's probably 50 LPs in the fund now. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure I'll probably get to, you know, I don't know if I'll hit my 99 cap, but um, I have no problem having, you know, a lot of smaller individual LPs in the fund because I know that um, like their value to, to me as, you know, a source of, you know, a source of leads to invest in or a source of support for these entrepreneurs is way more valuable than the, that like outstrips the, the check size that they wrote. Sure. Yeah. And look, I, you know, if the LinkedIn contact is busy, I'm a product nerd as well. So anytime, if you want to text me a prototype, okay. uh, if you want to give me some feedback and we've actually got some product people here too. Um, well, Hey man, this was so amazing. I, I know we have like nine minutes left, so I want to give uh, a little bit of time to the, to the group here. If anybody has any questions, uh, you know, if you want to text it, you can, or, you know, if you don't want to, uh, yell it out, or you can just, uh, you know, unmute and, and ask your question. Any questions, guys? Well, while they're thinking, um, at the end of every discussion, yeah, I, 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 oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go uh, ahead I, yes, Angle. So, um, you know, thanks for coming to speak with us. So my question is, um, does your VC do any investments outside the U.S. Uh, emerging markets, for example, and uh, what are the special considerations you would have um, if, um, if we are to do such investments? Yeah, so I, I'm not investing um, in emerging markets. I'm only investing in the U.S. and Canada, and really it's a function of um, my ability to be helpful to companies. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. You know it's, it's a blind spot for me as an investor. I haven't invested in, in Asia, Latin America, or Africa um, I've spent a little bit of, and, and so if I can't immediately be helpful to a company, then I'm not really sure why my investment is any more compelling to that founder than the next person's investment. I mean, that, that's one thing, Joel, to your, you know, one of your questions around working with Chris, one of the things that I learned most acutely from him was that he felt like he could be provide an unfair advantage to companies if he knew he could be helpful. Right. He felt like yeah. he could give them, you know, a slightly better chance of success um, if he knew that he had, you know, relevant domain expertise or industry relationships or, you know, uh, acute product feedback or, or what have you. And um, if I don't think I can help level up a company immediately, um, then I probably shouldn't be, uh, you know, probably shouldn't be investing in, the, in, in what they're building because now I'm basically relying and hope relying on everyone else on the cap table and hoping everyone else on the cap table um, can, can do that work. So um, is that a, is there a philosophy yeah. shared by many VCs that, you know, kind of have to contribute beyond just the finance? Um, you, you um, need to, yeah. I, I would hope so. You know, though I, I've certainly seen, you know, free riding, exist on, uh, you know, on cap tables. I do, I do think though that um, one of the things that I do think 
um, that took me a little while to appreciate actually is this notion of um, a VC being excited about, about a space, right? It's not just enough that the company is growing really quickly. Um, like I remember sending a deal to a friend and the company was doing really, really well. And he was like, this, you know, it's great that they're doing, they're growing so quickly, but I'm just not excited about this category. Yeah. And I was like, what do you mean you're not excited about? Like the company's growing, you know, at this insane rate, they're going to raise this huge series A. Don't you want to be a part of, like, and, and this was, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago. And over time I sort of grew a deeper appreciation for that notion of like, and a founder should want that. A founder should want their VC, their investor yeah. to be excited about what they're building and be excited to get on the phone with that founder, you know, every month for the next decade. Right. If, if I'm not, ex whether the company is doing well or not doing well, right. If you're only excited about the company because about the company because of their metrics, then you probably shouldn't invest in that company. And so for me, like that's a sort of an immediate heuristic that I use. And fortunately I've self-selected for categories that I'm excited about. So like, mm -hmm. I'm not excited about esports. This fund will never invest in esports. It's not a category or theme that I explicitly am investing in. Um, I've selected for categories that I have a level of excitement and enthusiasm um, and passion for we're investing in. And I'm very public about what those categories are on, on the site. And I do that for a reason. Um, I still get p pitches for companies that aren't, <laughs> that aren't a fit, but I've done my best to try and sort of curate, um, you know, inbound uh, and, and intros and referrals to based on what I'm sharing sort of much more explicitly about, about the fund. All right. Uh, thank you. Sure. Yeah, it's helpful advice. And I think, um, you know, the, the thing I'll add to that is, you know, we, we all see the world differently, right? So, I mean, some people may just be passionate about marketplaces and then other people might just, um, you know, just be super excited or fired up about, you know, the next Twitter. Right. Um, so, so I think, um, and I think for me, sometimes I, I feel like I'm pinching myself. Some of the deep tech companies that, um, that I've gotten, involved in. I'm like, wow, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that I was able to get in because some of them are really hard to, to get into. So, you know, the fact that somebody is able to kind of allow you to come on the journey with them, um, it's, it works two ways, right? I mean, it, the greatest founders, and I don't know if you feel this too, but I mean, I feel like sometimes, wow, I'm like, I'm really glad that they, they let me get involved, you know, cause it's just, um, I mean, that's to get in. one of my friends describes this, who's another investor. He describes this, this is the only, um, asset class where the asset picks their investor yeah all right like like i can invest in Am amazon doesn't have to let me invest yeah. right a piece of real estate doesn't have to let me invest in it or purchase it it's the owner has to sell it to me but like i'm investing in a founder and that founder has to say adam like i want you to be an investor in the company um and so the other day a founder asked me like why are you excited to talk to, talk to me for the next 30 minutes and it was like one of the first times ever that I got that question asked up yeah. front to me. And I had a, you know, fortunately I had a very good answer. And mm -hmm. I was, you know, I had an answer why I was excited about what they were building and the category and, you know, a thesis around it. But it's a very fair question mm -hmm. for, I think, every founder to ask every investor. Um, and, you know, investors don't get put on the spot often by, by entrepreneurs. And when you do, it's, it's like a very, it's a very humbling experience. And I think it should happen more frequently. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Um, I'm going to ask my cliche question. So any uh, really profound life advice that you have, you know, any, anything from a mentor um, doesn't have to be Chris Saka, you know, could be yeah. your, your family, your friends, your, your, you know, one of your mentors, any, uh, any nugget of advice that, uh, that you'd like to share? Yeah. I mean, my, my dad said this to me, said to me multiple times, people, people like doing business with people they like. Mm -hmm. um, and I think yeah, I agree with that fundamentally people want to want to work with people that they feel good about and can have sort of a strong relationship with first and foremost prior to or as a as a foundation for an investment a partnership a sale an m a event whatever a trend whatever type of transaction it is and so i think i always try and understand who the person is on the other side of the table mm -hmm. and try and also demonstrate that level of like empathy and transparency 
because I think ultimately we're investing. This is a very relationship driven business. The stage of investing is all about the relationship and all about the person, oftentimes more so than the idea in many cases um, or the product because the product might not even exist yet. And so um, trying to build and foster and nurture those relationships, I think is, um, is really like foundational for me and my approach to investing. And so I think that's something that's already, always, uh, always stuck with me. That's really helpful. Um, I know we're at time. Any final questions before we wrap up? Hey, I have a question um, either for Adam or Joel. Mm -hmm. um, just going back to the previous question about being passionate about the founder and their venture. Um, when you're looking for a first time job as a VC, how important is it that your passions align with the fund you're going to work for versus just getting your foot into the door? Um, Cause I could see it being problematic if you're not passionate about the same thing that others on the team are. Yeah, I mean, I think venture funds have a weird way of hiring, in my opinion. Yeah, <laughs> I, think I agree. If, um, you know, I think if if companies hire the way venture funds, um, if their portfolio portfolio companies hire the way venture funds do, venture funds would fire like every CEO at those companies. Um, like VCs just are notoriously awful at people management and, and HR and talent. And you've seen that the ramifications of that in terms of you know, diversity of, of investors and, and senior partners. And um, there's a lot of flaws in the, in the hiring model. When it comes to sort of like other, what they're passionate about versus what you're passionate about, say some firms look for people that are very, very complementary to them. They look for people that are doing, they bring a different network, they bring a different level of expertise, a different area of interest. Um, and those are the firms that um, you, know, you hope that what you're excited about and what your passion is kind of jives with what they're looking for and looking the role, they're look, the type of profile they're looking to fill. And in other cases, they're looking for someone who they might be looking to like double or triple down in an area, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we really need someone who is obsessed with SaaS <laughs> as much as we are, or we really want someone who is obsessed with, you know, consumer social the way we are. Um, and so my, my best advice on that front is to try and do as much sort of like reconnaissance as you can about firms and their personalities and profiles from other investors um, before approaching another fund or before, before you interview at a fund so that you can have a very clear understanding of what they're looking for. Because I, 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 mean, I remember interviewing at places and being like, yeah, I really don't like X, Y, and Z. And they're like, oh, well, that's all we are looking to fill right now. And I was like, great. So we can just end this interview after five minutes um, or, and, you know, we can save a lot of time here or, you know, I really want to do X, you know, I really care about this. And they're like, Oh, great. Like we're looking, we're, we're looking for someone to like fill that spot. We need someone who can do more consumer. Um, Cause we're like overloaded on enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, look at their portfolios, try and talk to other junior VCs, junior VCs know way more about what's going on than almost anyone like senior partners are very removed from like the weeds of the fund and the dynamics of the industry. And, um, you know, junior VCs know like where all the bodies are buried, so to speak, they know where all, they know all the dirt. Um, like if I want to like build a relationship with a fund to like source deals, I go to like the, like high flying senior associate or principal because they're always looking to get deals done rather than the partner necessarily. Um, like the senior associate or principal will send me the stuff that like they really want to do, but their partner like is like not into. Um, and so, um, you know, use, use them as a resource for, you know, your own sort of research on what firms are looking, looking for and, and, you know, the culture and personality of, of the roles they're trying to fill. Yeah. And just a quick follow to that. Um, you know, if I'm doing a hard pivot, which I've done like two times already, I, I was a straight up electrical engineer and then I pivoted into product and then, and then venture. So I'm less picky if I don't have any of the skill sets, right? So if I'm an engineer and I'm trying to break into VC and I hate healthcare, I'll take a healthcare venture job in Oklahoma. And there's actually a friend of mine that works at Oklahoma 
as a VC and he had a job opportunity and um, nobody, you know, is making fun of some people. I was like, guys, like there's an opportunity here. Nobody wanted to take it, but, um, but, you know, after I've gotten some of the skill sets and I've, I've uh, built a little bit of um, a background uh, and I feel that I'm confident that I can, you know, maybe land a role in New York, then I'll start getting a little more picky. But I think if you, for me, it's really just been the, the level of, um, pivot the, that I've had to make. And, you know, I think I, I've been a little more selective once I've built more of a foundation and, you know, some more experience, um, but it's tough, right? It's tough to be picky if, because to be honest, I mean, there, number one, there isn't that many jobs in venture, you know, and many of them are not posted. Um, you know, some of them you'll see have been there for like the last six months and, uh, you know, probably already got filled. So um, I'd say, you know, try to take it, you know, maybe even in the beginning, you know, be a little flexible with pay. And I think the money will come and in, in, yeah, I think it'll all work out somehow, but that's just my, that's just my experience and that's, what's helped me. Um, but again, you know, it's going to be different for everybody. So. Awesome. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. Cool. Great. Well, I know we're over time. So Adam, you know, thanks again, you know, sorry, we ran over a little bit, but no worries. Appreciate you popping in. Thanks for all the storytelling and the mentorship and, uh, you know, hope to catch up soon. Sounds great. Thanks, right. Joel. Thanks for Thanks having me.